Welcome back to the show that tells you, you are a quantum computer exerting free will over your brain through repeated collapse of the wave function. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 22 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the quantum Zeno effect, the idea that repeated measurement will lock a system into a fixed physical state. By the end of today's episode, we'll ask the question, does attention utilize the quantum Zeno effect to manifest the human will into neural circuitry? This episode is available on YouTube, and an audio-only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and hop for metaphysical loop. See how concepts become objects and then become quadium. Join us for an episode of quantum consciousness. Hi there, my name is Justin Riddle. So I got a PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley in cognitive neuroscience. And while I was there, I taught a class on quantum consciousness. I taught it for seven years, I really enjoyed it. And this podcast is really a translation, an update, and an extension of that material for a wider audience. In my day job, I am a neuroscientist and I use electric and magnetic brain stimulation to probe the role of neural oscillations in cognitive control and to try to develop novel interventions for psychiatric illness. All right, so the topic for today's episode is the quantum Zeno effect. So the outline for this episode is we're gonna do a bit of a recap on the topics of last week, which was the concept of movement and how measurement is a critical part of movement in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Then I'll introduce to you the quantum Zeno effect and how that sort of plays on this notion of movement. And then I'll introduce the ideas of attention and how William James, a prominent psychologist in our history, really conceptualized attention and how that fits in with this notion of quantum Zeno effect. And I'll end the episode talking about how attention might be using the quantum Zeno effect in order to sort of translate the quantum mind, the quantum computation ongoing in the brain into neural circuitry and sort of that interplay between the two. And I'll be talking a lot about the work of Henry Stapp and uh, Jeffrey Schwartz. And then we'll wrap it all up by talking about um, obsessive compulsive disorder and how Jeffrey Schwartz conceptualizes how the Zeno effect might play a role in sort of highlighting this pathology and the relationship between the human mind and the human brain. So I want to start, as we have in the past, on this really critical experiment in the history of quantum mechanics, which is the double slit experiment. And the double slit experiment basically shows that if you send a single quantum system, let's say a photon or an electron, and you shoot it at two different slits, they will go into a wave function, enter an interference pattern where it's as if that system goes through both of the slits simultaneously, and then there's sort of this wave-like interference between the two different paths that the system is going down. And then if you place a measuring device at one of the two slits, you can measure which of the slits did the system really go through, and when you do that, it reverts back to behaving like a particle, like something um, that you would expect to see in our everyday lives, right? It's as if there's just like bullets going through the two different slits. And so what this really shows us is that the act of measurement is not really just the acquisition of information, but you're really performing an action on the system. You're changing the system fundamentally. And Werner Heisenberg called this a, an action. And so it's often being described more recently as a Heisenberg action. So by performing a measurement, we're not only getting some information out, but we're changing, we're altering, we're acting upon the system. And so measurements should be reconceptualized as a action. Cross out measurement, replace it with the word action, and that'll make a lot of, of the discussion today make a lot more sense. 
So when talking about Zeno of Elia in the previous episode, we talked about how he has a few paradoxes, and this really asserts that reality is discrete, that space and time are occupying just these discrete locations in space, these discrete moments in time. There is no space between two locations in space, and there is no time between two moments in time. There is just here and now, then and there, these are discrete occurrences. And then movement is you become measured, you're acted upon, you're in a particular location at a particular moment in time. You enter a wave function of multiple locations simultaneously, and then you get measured again and you get locked into that new location. And this is movement, right? Measured, acted upon, going into multiple places simultaneously as a probability distribution or a wave function of all these different possible new locations. And then you're acted upon, you're measured, you become present in that new location. And movement is a series of measurements where you allow the system to evolve out from the location that it started off at. Now the quantum Zeno effect comes in and it basically says, what happens if we measure the system really rapidly? So in order for something to move, it needs to evolve away from that location that it started at. But that evolution has to occur over a period of time. And so if we are to measure it really rapidly, really quickly, there's a higher probability that it is in the location that it started at. Essentially, it tries to evolve away, but it gets measured and it comes back to that original location. Um, and Alan Turing has a quote that I'm gonna read to you right now on that topic. It is easy to show using standard theory that if a system starts in an eigenstate of some observable and measurements are made of that observable n times a second, then even if the state is not a stationary one, the probability that the system will be in the same state after, say, one second, tends to one as n tends to infinity. That is, that continual observations will prevent motion. So essentially, things take time to evolve, but if we can measure really rapidly, we can more or less lock a system into a single state. It's as if it's unable to move. This is often called the watched pot never boils effect, where if we were able to watch every single atom within a pot of water, then it would actually never boil because you're measuring it so continuously, you're acting upon it so continuously that nothing is ever to, able to bounce into anything else and it would theoretically never boil. But it also resonates with that sort of uh, commonplace idea that if you're staring at a pot of water, it's never gonna boil. You have to look away and then suddenly it starts boiling. You look back and, and there it is boiling. So that's kind of a, a fun association with uh, a human idiom. So the quantum Zeno effect in its extreme suggests that if you have a radioactive element, let's say you have uranium, and essentially if you measure that atom that's about to decay, radioactive decay, there's basically a superposition of not decaying and then decaying. But if you measure it and you find that it's in the not decayed state, then it's gonna take a little bit of time for the superposition to evolve out to encompass with significant probability that decay option. So what that means is if you measure it fairly quickly, you can make it so that it's not able to build up enough probability that it would realistically actually decay. And so, strangely, even though different atoms have like a half-life associated with, this is the roughly the amount of time that will pass where there's a 50% chance that it's gonna decay. And so over time, the probability that an atom that's radioactive is going to grow unstable and decay tends to get higher and higher probability. But if we measure it near continuously, then we can make it so this radioactive atom will never decay. And I think this is sort of a mind blowing concept that you could have a fundamentally unstable atom and lock it from decaying ever 
through continuous measurement. What is this measurement? It's probably shooting some laser beams at the, at the atom itself. And then just the action of measurement is essentially locking it in, in place. Once again, if we think about this as acquiring information from the system, it's weird. It's like, wait, how would this really make any difference? But if we think of measurement as an action upon the system, then yeah, we're taking an atom, we're continuously interacting with it. And so it's a little bit less surprising that you would have it unable to, to decay, for example. Where is this in our pop culture? Uh, there's this really great episode of Doctor Who called Blink. And this is where they first meet the, uh, the angels. And these are these like interdimensional beings that have a lot of crazy powers. But essentially, every time you look at the, the angels, they turn into stone. And so in the show, you have to maintain eye contact with the angel. And essentially, you're measuring the angel with your eyes. And that locks it into this physical state of stone. And then if you look away or you blink, the angel enters into this superposition, essentially, and is able to attack you or, or basically it throws you into another space-time reality. But this is really a play on the quantum Zeno effect in pop culture. And the doctor describes it as uh, the quantum locked. So he even refers sort of to the Zeno effect where the angels are locked into the state because they're under a near continuous state of measurement through the human eye. Now, whether or not the human eye is actually performing measurements on the environment, um, I think it, it needs to be shown. But there are some theories that the eye actually emits light. So who knows? Maybe, maybe there's something to it, but uh, maybe there's not. All right. So what does this mean for the human mind and for the human experience? So I'm going to read a quote from William James, who is really sort of considered like the progenitor of modern psychology. And here is the quote. I have spoken as if our attention were wholly determined by neural conditions. I believe that the array of things we can attend to is so determined. No object can catch our attention except by the neural machinery. But the amount of the attention which an object receives after it has caught our mental eye is another question. It often takes effort to keep the mind upon it. We feel that we can make more or less of the effort as we choose. If this feeling be not deceptive, if our effort be a spiritual force, then of course it contributes co-equally with the cerebral conditions to the result. Though it introduce no new idea, it will deepen and prolong the stay in consciousness of innumerable ideas which else would fade more quickly away. It is often a matter of but a second more or less of attention at the outset, which one system shall gain force to occupy the field and develop itself and exclude the other, or be excluded itself by the other. The whole drama of the voluntary life hinges on the amount of attention, slightly more or slightly less, which rival motor ideas may receive. Effort may be an original force and not a mere effect, and it may be indeterminate in amount. So I know he's speaking in sort of a, an older tongue, but essentially what this means is that ideas will pop into your head. You don't really know where the idea came from, but what you do is you pay attention to that idea or you let it fade away. And William James basically makes the argument that all of human free will is the ability to pay attention or to not pay attention. So ideas are coming up into our mind from our brain. And as those ideas pop into our mind, we sustain the idea through attention, through mental effort. We pay attention to that idea and it proliferates, it generates more from that idea, or we choose not to pay attention to it, that idea fizzles, that thought process fades away, and then it's less likely to show up again in the future. And William James says that all of human free will is that action of paying attention or not. You have never, according to William James, created any thoughts. You have never willed yourself to do anything that didn't just pop into your head. And so our entire mental life, 
all of our morality, all of our ethics, all of our choices are determined by choosing to sustain something in our mind with attention or choosing to let it fade away into the background. And so Henry Stapp, he takes this concept of William James's mental effort of this attention and he applies this to the quantum Zeno effect. So the argument goes that there's this generation of different possibilities created through the brain, through this neural circuitry, and then these spring into the mind and the mind under his conceptualization is a quantum computer and there's different possibilities, different options that are presented and then the mind will choose one of those options to pay attention to or not. And by paying attention, now you lock that system in. And so the idea here is that the quantum Zeno effect is the mind creating a repeated collapse of the wave function onto one physical state at the exclusion of the others. So the mind is paying attention to one thing and that mental effort is a repeated collapse of the wave function. So you're paying attention and as you're locked into that concept, into that idea, you're paying attention to it, your mind is continuously measuring that physical state. This is a quantum Zeno effect and then the brain starts to respond to that repeated measurement. That repeated measurement is locking in the physical state. It's unable to evolve away from that. And if we draw in the neural circuitry of the brain, you're essentially locking in some neural circuitry pattern and then the brain is able to respond to that, right? So Henry Stapp is essentially saying that the quantum Zeno effect is our attention. The mind is guiding the collapse of the wave function and it's creating this sustained physical presence of the mind within the brain. And the big question here, right, is how does the mind influence the brain in any sort of meaningful way? And so this is the solution. It's through repeated measurement. A single mind action, a single effortful moment, um, a single collapse might not be sufficient to create a physical repercussion of that mental event, but through repeated collapse, you can break through some of the neural circuitry more effectively. And so Jeffrey Schwartz comes in and he has a few meetings with Henry Stapp and he is a psychologist uh, at UCLA and essentially he works with obsessive compulsive disorder. And these are patients who are presented with these obsessive thoughts and then these compulsive actions in response to these obsessive thoughts, right? Some of these thoughts are, you're dirty, you have germs, uh, your, your stove is on, you need to go turn off your stove. There's these worries, these fears, and these concerns that are sort of involuntarily being brought into the mind repeatedly. And so what Jeffrey Schwartz says is that this really highlights the difference between mental effort and attention and neural circuitry. And so through our habits, through time, the neural circuitry is trained to occupy certain patterns of thought. However, your mind in this moment is receiving these different thoughts and you have a chance in this moment to react to those thoughts or to not react. And so Jeffrey Schwartz is basically making the argument that the brain has faulty circuitry within the OCD pathology where there's this recurrent neural activity generating this pathological worry. And it is the, essentially the, the goal of the patient is to separate those thoughts from their identity in a way and say, I am not those thoughts. My brain is generating these thoughts. I am this effortful, willful, attention pain mind in this moment, and I can choose to pay attention to something else right now. 
And so you exert mental effort. And within the quantum mechanical framing or the quantum computer digital mind framing, this digital computer brain is generating all these pathological ideas and the quantum mind needs to collapse the wave function towards other options. And I think this really highlights that there's all this heavy in learning, right? These cells that wire together, fire together. The brain has built up all this digital infrastructure of patterns of activity. And the mind now needs to go against the brain and relearn or re-sculpt the neural circuitry. And in that moment, the mind needs to shift and collapse the wave function towards new ideas. Maybe there isn't even a new idea in that moment, but if you could hold off on collapsing towards that outcome and then wait for the occurrence spontaneously of a new opportunity, then collapsing upon that new opportunity effortfully, applying some quantum Zeno effect to this new pathway that has emerged repeated collapse to this new circuitry. And then over time, that will train the brain towards generating new pathways. So I'll leave you to think about this more on your own time, but really question, is my brain a digital computer that has been running for my entire life, building connections, building associations in sort of this non-conscious, unconscious, subconscious way Maybe at one time in the past, you thought about this, you paid attention to this. Now it's been locked into your brain, cemented into your brain digitally. You're no longer paying attention to it, but can you sort of take the reins of your brain back, right? You are a quantum mind riding on top of this digital brain. Can you reapply your attention to new pathways and it's very challenging initially to break a habit, to break an identity, to break the way that you've always done things. But theoretically, it's possible. Over time, new habits can be built. And the quantum mechanical framework of viewing our minds should be fundamentally self-empowering, where suddenly you're not at the mercy of your genetics, you're not at the mercy of your circuitry, you have the capacity to recollapse your wave function towards different options. They need to spontaneously emerge, but through new information streams, maybe you know me talking to you right now is gonna generate new opportunities of what to pay attention to, what to collapse into, and can you guide your mind to generating new quantum Zeno effects in your brain reshaping that physical world of your brain through effortful mental attention, repeated observation, repeated collapse of your desired preferred brain, right? This is a chance to change yourself, to change your brain through the quantum mind. So I'll leave you with that. Take back the reins of your own brain and I'll talk to you again soon.